Hey, what's up, chemistry people? It's uh, it's Mr. Boylan here, and today we are going to explain the difference between collisions that convert reactants to products and those that do not in terms of energy distributions and molecular orientation. Your quick breakdown today isn't so quick. We're going to talk about how a successful reaction is one in which the reactant mo molecules collide with both sufficient energy and with correct orientation. Two, we're going to explain the concept of what is called an activated complex and activation energy and relate those terms to an energy profile or one of those energy diagrams. Uh, three, we are going to describe how surface area and temperature affect the number of successful collisions in a reaction. And lastly, we're going to talk about how the Arrhenius equation essentially determines the effect of temperature and activation on the rate of reaction. In other words, uh, how it defines for us our rate constant K. All right, so first, some quick notes here. As we talk about uh, collision theory, which is going to be the focus for today's video, uh, we need to understand that we're going to be focusing on what are called elementary reactions. And these are just reactions that proceed from your reactants to your products in a single step. Um, and they're just a single transition state. And again, those are known as elementary reactions. And we'll sort of talk a little bit more, more about these in the, the next uh, video as well. But just recognize uh, uh, reactants to products in a single step and there's just one transition state. If we have a elementary reaction then in which we have a single reactant, that type of uh, elementary reaction is known as a unimolecular reaction. In an elementary reaction involving two reactants, uh, those are known as bimolecular. Uh, those two uh, reactants can be the same molecule, keep that in mind. Uh, but beyond that, it's uh, really rare to see an elementary reaction involving three or more reactant particles colliding. Um, and I know maybe in some equations we often see more than three uh, reactants. However, we're going to be talking about sort of the elementary reactions or elementary steps. It's really rare to see um, more than two uh, reactants in a, an elementary step or an elementary reaction. But let's sort of talk about some of the fundamental conditions that we need in order for the reaction to occur in those elementary steps or those elementary reactions. One, the reactant molecules, the things you're reacting, have to collide. They have to interact with one another. Two, not only do they have to collide, but they have to collide with a sufficient amount of energy, and we call that uh, activation energy. And it's just this energy barrier that must be overcome before the reaction can take place. So if we have a collision, but they don't collide with sufficient energy, uh, the reaction is not going to take place. This uh, sort of energy profile or energy diagram should be pretty familiar to you, but uh, basically just breaks down the idea that uh, in order for the particles to react, there has to be some, they have to react with a certain amount of uh, energy. And that energy, uh, you know, is called the activation energy. And so as you look at this equation, you've got hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And these molecules will react to form water. But you can have a balloon full of these reactants, your hydrogen and oxygen gas. But it's never going to uh, react to form that water unless you add that activation energy. Many times it comes in the form of heat. Bottom line, in order for the reaction to proceed, you have to add some energy in to get those uh, molecules in order to begin to react. Okay, so not only do they have to collide with the right amount of uh, activation energy, they also have to collide in the, in the correct orientation or with a specific geometry um, in order for the rearrangement of uh, the reactant bonds to produce those product bonds. Um, so when we define uh, successful or effective collisions as it applies to these sort of elementary reactions, we're thinking about how they have to have both sufficient energy and the correct orientation and to allow the uh, reaction to occur. And so as you look at the example that's provided to you in your notes, um, you've got these two molecules of NOCl gas that are reacting with one another. Um, and recognize, uh, sort of indicated here by the blurriness, uh, but you could imagine maybe some uh, vector arrows describing the amount of 
uh, energy that they possess. Um, so not only do they have to react with uh, the correct amount of activation energy, but they have to do so in the correct orientation. And as you look at the orientations that you're provided with in your notes, uh, two of which are, are ineffective collisions, we would say, uh, they're not oriented the correct way in order to essentially break those reactant bonds and form those product bonds. But that last one there does show us how they could be correctly oriented in order for uh, the reaction to occur. Unsuccessful collisions then are those that lack sufficient energy and or correct orientation and therefore they do not lead to a reaction. Uh, in most cases or most reactions, only a small percentage of the collisions are actually uh, effective. Um, and so when we talk about uh, percent yield and things like this, uh, we may you know, bring collision theory into play, but uh, recognize that it's those two things that need to happen in order for the reaction to be successful or effective. We have to have the correct amount of activation energy, one, and two, they have to collide with the correct orientation. Okay, now this brings us to what's called the activated complex, and it is the chemical species uh, that sort of has these partial bonds uh, and is the structure at the maximum energy point along the reaction path. And so as you uh, look at some of the energy profiles that you have uh, in your notes there, um, at the sort of peak there or at the, the maximum amount of energy or at the sort of maximum of your energy profiles there, we, we say we have that transition state or that activated complex uh, where we sort of have these partial bonds that exist um, as, we, as we transfer from our reactants uh, to our products. Um, and it's important to note that uh, we can also define uh, activation energy as the difference in energy between the uh, reactants and that activated complex. And again, I encourage you to check out that example that you're given in your notes um, as uh, a good reference. Now there are a couple of things we need to think about as we consider collision theory. One, uh, when you increase the surface area of a solid reactant, it can increase the rate um, by essentially increasing the number of collisions um, that will be successful. Um, and again, I think this is very easy to think about as you think about uh, what we did in the first year chem class and we sort of crushed up that sugar molecule, that sugar cube, and you were thinking about uh, getting it to dissolve more quickly in, um, in water. Uh, surface area is a great way to sort of speed up the rate of the reaction. In this case, we're talking about allowing uh, the number of uh, collisions to increase. And then two, you wanna think about temperature as a key thing that will affect the rate. Um, uh, when you increase the temperature, you're gonna increase the average kinetic energy of the particles, uh, thus allowing more collisions uh, between reactants. And so ultimately then, uh, as you think about the average kinetic energy of the particles increasing, um, again, as you increase that temperature, the number of particles that possess that required activation energy is also going to increase. And as you think about that on a Maxwell-Boltzmann plot here, uh, again, uh, T1 there represents uh, the lower temperature uh, where you have a smaller fraction of uh, reactants or molecules that have the correct amount of activation energy in order to have a successful collision. By heating things up, uh, note that you've got a greater distribution of molecules that have that activation energy, that required activation energy, and therefore you have a greater amount of successful collision. So heat them up, speed them up, get that, uh, get that get those successful collisions to happen in order to have the reaction proceed okay which brings us to the Arrhenius equation uh, this equation is no longer on the uh, AP chemistry formula chart however it's a super important equation to think about and even though the equation itself is no longer on um, on the AP formula chart, sort of what we can derive from the equation, the understandings we can derive from the equation still are on the AP test. So keep that in mind as you're sort of uh, working through the next uh, couple of sections in your notes here. Um, you don't have to memorize the equation uh, unless you, you want to. It is a good equation to keep in mind. But basically the equation relates uh, how we can define the rate constant for a chemical reaction and how it relates uh, temperature and the activation energy of the reaction. And as you break down the Arrhenius equation, um, that A value is what's called the frequency factor. And it is a term that includes things like uh, the frequency of the collisions and their orientation. It varies very slightly over uh, temperature, small temperature ranges. Um, so many times it's taken as a constant. Um, 
your EA value there is your activation energy, R is your gas constant, be careful. Note, we're using the R value that's the energy R value, the 8.314. I know that many times we uh, get confused about which R value to use, but energy here, so make sure you use the, uh, the energy gas constant. And then your temperature is gonna be in Kelvins with the absolute temperature scale here. And even though, again, you're not asked to memorize the formula or you won't be asked to solve anything using this formula, you should take away two really important things. One, note that a larger T value uh, is gonna create a smaller negative exponent. Um, therefore, K will increase with increasing temperature. Uh, your rate constant K is gonna get bigger. Uh, the rate of your reactions is gonna happen more quickly, uh, the, the hotter it is. And two, note that a larger activation energy uh, is gonna create a larger negative exponent. Um, therefore, your rate constant K is gonna decrease uh, with increasing activation energy. In other words, that hump in your energy profile increases. The more energy it takes to get over that hump, um, the, the slower the reaction is going to, or the slower the rate uh, of the reaction is gonna be. Now, uh, again, you won't be asked to do this on the AP Chemistry exam, but an important couple of things to walk away with. Uh, one, the Rennes equation can be re rearranged. Again, don't worry about how, uh, but to give us another equation that's in slope intercept form, which is super nice anytime we're trying to uh, make predictions or estimations, or just in general make better sense of uh, the data that we're given. And just to summarize then, uh, things to sort of take away from this idea is that if you plot the natural log of the rate constant K versus the reciprocal of your Kelvin temperature, uh, you will get a straight line with the slope, your M value there, equal to the negative of the activation energy over your gas constant R. Uh, now, why is this uh, important? Uh, that means that if you ever wanted to calculate the activation energy that you needed for a given reaction, um, and you're using the Arrhenius equation, you can figure that out simply by multiplying the negative of your gas constant times your slope. Um, and again, keep in mind we want to use uh, the the gas constant that's our energy energy gas constant, the 8.31. And then uh, likewise, there is another way you can manipul manipulate the Arrhenius equation so that if you're provided two uh, temperature and uh, rate constant uh, values, data points, uh, you can plug it into this equation and ultimately figure out what the activation energy is gonna be for your given reaction. Again, a lot of these formulas uh, are no longer on the AP Chemistry test, uh, but I think it's important to uh, understand them and. Uh, realize where the rate constant K comes from, uh, how it's defined, and um, sort of some of the big things to take away from the Arrhenius equation.